I've taught English in South Korea, Spain, and also in Ireland. So I'm actually going to draw on that experience and my experiences teaching in those environments, but also learning those languages. Uh, not terribly well, but giving it a go to actually learn those languages and how being a, being a speaker of another language can actually be beneficial for you in the class and how it can help you uh, deal with uh, deal with problems that your students have regarding grammar and vocabulary and how you can help your students predict those uh, those problems. Um, so just first, can I get a show of hands who can actually speak a language that isn't English and, and that isn't Irish? Uh, Peter, what, what do you speak? Yeah, Spanish. Spanish, fairly well. You can be good? Fairly well, yeah. Fairly well. Somebody else, sorry, can I get a some non Spanish? Anyone not speak Spanish? No? Uh, French. French. Anybody else? You said uh, Natalie was? Natalie, yeah. Natalie, yes. Russian and German. Russian and German, okay, very good. And do you find, just out of curiosity, do you use it in the classroom yeah, ever to. Yeah, mm. Now, do you use your French in the classroom? Yeah, a little bit, using my knowledge to like understand yeah. why certain students make, the French speaking students make yeah. certain things. I often draw parallels, you know, oh, that's. Just like in German, this word. Mm. Do you say the same? Is it the same? So the you'd language? actually you'd actually use some German words in the class and actually mm. write and structures. Structures, yeah. I would mm. say like this is. I'm mm. sure that. Would you have done that in Spanish, Peter? Yeah, but I, but I, I wouldn't use this construction. I'd say. So is that similar to how it is in your language? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, it is. That's why yeah. I intended that way, yeah. and it, it clicks for them. Well, sometimes they make a mistake in English, but then you say, "Well, in German, it's just exactly the same." And they're like, "Oh, that's true." Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're great. You get a eureka moment there. Yeah. Or if you say, "Well, you said it like this, we said it like this," yeah. and you think, "Okay, yeah, I wish what somebody had explained that, saying that to me before." So anyway, there's a ton of languages in the world. And if you don't speak, obviously, yes, <laughs> thankfully we would have a job. Yeah. Um, and if you don't speak one that's not English, then you will have a problem communicating with somebody who doesn't speak your language. So, obviously, being able to communicate with people um, is, is extremely important. It's what we know what makes us different from animals, and um, it's, uh, it's obviously essential both to our jobs and to our, to our abilities to communicate. So the first thing is that some languages have things that are universal, right? They are, there are things that exist in every single language, regardless, uh, regardless of if it's, what, what it's, if it's Latin or if it's Sans, uh, Sanskrit origin or any kind of origin. Some languages have the exact same things. All languages have subjects. <coughs> All languages have verbs. All languages have some way of expressing cause and effect. All languages deal with motion and trajectory and path in some kind of way. All languages talk about the manner and way you do something quickly, slowly, something like that, or if you, you jump, swim, as opposed to walk or climb. And, some, um, and every language has some way of hypothesizing, imagining, some level of abstraction and metaphor. So two things that I'm going to focus on in this one are this one, motion, path, and manner. And I'm going to do that by drawing on, by making a comparison between um, English and Spanish. So hopefully, at the, by the end of the, the, uh, my talk, I will have convinced you, if you don't speak another language, that it is actually really beneficial for you to learn the fundamentals of another language and how that can actually um, form part of a very useful, robust uh, curriculum, a CPD, it's Continuous Professional Development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It does help. <laughs> um, so yeah, so those are, that's what I'd like, what I would like you to uh, get this language learning. Uh, as, a, as a teacher is a very good thing. So, um, what I'd like you to do first, just think of a, a, very, uh, a class, an elementary level class. And imagine your, your students are reading the textbook and they encounter a line such as, the teacher walked out of the classroom. Now that seems quite simple. Quite seems like something that's very manageable even for an elementary level student. So let's just look at the different components in the, in the sentence. The teacher, one of the first things they probably learn, it's basic now. Walk, very basic verb. Again, beginner level, they'll certainly learn that word. Out of. Again, out, it's an adverb, it's also a preposition, but here it's functioning as an adverb, and it's very, it's again, very common. They'll get that in New English 5 beginner level, um, and it shows path and trajectory. A classroom, another very uh, basic noun. So, if you're a teacher, I would wager the most difficult thing about teaching that sentence would be the grammar either the word order or the, or the past symbol. If you were to look at it and say, okay, what, what are the students going to have 
issue with here. And so I just want to look at that sentence a little bit closer again and actually draw your attention to, to an issue, something that really isn't dealt with very much in, uh, in certainly in the, in the TEFL books. And certainly when I did my, my CELTA course, it wasn't something on the curriculum you might be able to uh, correct me here, Julie. But let's just look at the uh, what we have. Look, look at the, the verb, walked. So what does that verb give us? The verb gives us the manner in which something is done. Right? Now look at the adverb, out. Out conveys path. It conveys trajectory. So you can, the teacher can walk up, down, in, out, over, across, under, around. In this case, we have path, we have out. So let's just imagine how we would say that in Spanish, and you might correct my, my poor Spanish here, just a sec. So you have the Spanish version is el profesor salió de la clase. And what you have here is the verb, so this is, in Spanish follows the same, um, it's a subject verb object language. We have, the, we have the subject, and then we have the verb. But the verb doesn't give us manner the way it gives us manner in English. The verb will give us, the verb, the verb is salir, and it gives us, it, it, the verb is to exit. So what you get is the teacher exited the class. And you get no mention at all of, I don't know if you can see that, sorry, no, no indication of manner. The teacher walk, run, jump, skip, dance, we don't know. So, um, that's it's a very important difference, and we'll see why here. So imagine another situation. Okay, you have a bird. A bird, that's a gif, it's supposed to be flapping, and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so in English we would say something, imagine you'd say, the bird flew down from out of, the hole in, out of a hole in the tree. We can imagine, if you, if you said that in English exactly, you, you can imagine... You can imagine what that, that, that's an easy enough thing to imagine, but for a Spanish speaker, it's almost impossible to, to just, not, not impossible, to, but to actually translate that is very, very different. A Spanish person would say something like, they would focus on first the exit. The bird exited the tree and descended. Or the bird exited the tree and fell or went down. Okay, and let's just look at those two sentences again. So the bird flew down from out of a hole in the tree, and the bird exited the tree and descended. But we've no mention of fly. Now, why don't we have a mention of fly? Well, you got to think, well, why, why would you mention fly? What else is a bird going to do? Birds fly. The bird isn't going to, isn't going to drive out of the tree. What, what else is a, is a teacher going to do? A te teachers walk out of rooms. Run. Run. Yeah. Run. Yeah. Run crying as well. <laughs> so birds fly, and uh, birds fly and humans walk. And so it really kind of shows how superfluous some of the language is in English. Why, why would you say the bird flew down? Obviously birds fly down. People walk out. And so this is one of the things that, that Latin um, students whose languages are derived from Latin and have a problem with. Portuguese, Italian, Spanish, sometimes French as well. And you very often you get production like, oh, I back to my class. Because they're putting the focus on the on the direction. And for them, well I yeah, I walked back. Obviously I walked back. Or I went back. Obviously that that's for them it's not uh, it's not necessary to give you that information. It should be coded already. Um, it's up to the the listener to to determine that or just to assume that it was fly or it was walk. Mm -hmm. So, what's it? It's done a lot from people in the school. <laughs> so let's just have a look at some, some example sentences here. So in English, you would say the girl ran home. And in Spanish, it would basically have a one-to-one -one mapping of the exact same information. You would say the girl ran fast. And in Spanish again, you basically have a one-to-one -one mapping of the same information. Syntactically, semantically, same thing. The girl ran in a race, same thing. So we, we, you can see, okay, this is the verb to run, this is the verb to run, the verb to run. And this is, so this, it's useful to know because this is, uh, and so it, this is much easier for students to get because all we're talking about here is manner. But the problem arises is when you have motion path and manner together in the same sentence. Now it's a different kettle of fish. Now it's, a, it's, it's, it's more complex, and Spanish uh, speakers will produce something different. For example, 
imagine you say the girl ran and the girl ran up the stairs. So now we have run, which is our manner, up is the direction, is the trajectory. A Spanish speaker would say something like this. Now what do we have? Now the up is represented in the verb, and that gives us the path. The manner, the run, is represented by a particle that comes later on in the sentence. And that gives us the manner. And so this is, this is something that you will see again, time and time and time again, when you represent uh, motion and manner um, in Spanish sentences. And you will, if, if you li really listen to your, your Brazilian and Portuguese Spanish students, they will say these things. I went out running. I came in, I went out running, I came in running. Am I okay for time? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so, if you look, what, what do all these words have in common? They're all to do with walking, right? <coughs> now, can anyone tell me, what's the difference between, uh, say, to saunter and to stroll? Saunter is sassy. Saunter is sassy. Saunter is sassy. And you have, okay, I just, I just did something cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What about to trounce and to trudge? If you trounced across a field and you trudged across a field. Trans is like yeah. So, yeah. So this is, and this is awfully problematic as well because this is where English is so weird, right? This is where English. Why do we have so many words that that code for just a tiny little difference in the manner? But we like you know they are still quite common. It is uh, this is still the way you talk. Like you trounce, you know, you're you're annoyed. Like you storm out, you trounce in, you trounce through the the town or whatever. <laughs> and so, so a Spanish speaker would just say, would just say, I I I went you know, in a, in a, with big steps. Or if you sauntered into the room, they would say, I entered the room confidently. <laughs> or I entered the room having, feeling good after having completed something difficult, or something like that. There will be, there will be some sort of a compliment, or a, or a verb pattern, or something like that. It might be a particle that, that codes for that. And that's something, it's, 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 it's good to keep that in mind, right? It's, it's really useful information in the class if you know that. So what I'm what I will what I want to get at is don't don't be afraid of students L1 production in the class. I think it's you should kind of you should, yeah don't be afraid of it. I think you should enhance it. And just exactly like what um, what Peter was saying. The question I always ask my students is okay how do you say that in your language? Especially if it is something that that relating to like these things that that are the, the linguistic universals, cause and effect, um, you know, imagining, hypothesizing, metaphors. I mean, it's just naturally for us to say, you know, I got into trouble, or I fell in love, or something like that. But why do you think, okay, think about it for a second, why do you fall, and why is it in? Why don't you fall on love? You know, it's, and, and other languages might not share those metaphors, but we just think that they're natural, yeah, of course you fall in love. You know, of course, you, you get over a breakup. You know, why don't you, or you get over a cold, why not just get around a cold? I'm, I'm having trouble getting around this cold, for us just seems unnatural, but it's, it might be represented that way in, in a student's uh, language. So particularly with metaphors and things with directed motion, it's always useful to get some feedback from the students as to why they, they say those things. Um, so, basically. <laughs> Is that what I'm doing? Uh, I'm skeptical. <laughs> so, basically, no, definitely not. Obviously not. That's, uh, but we do get training. Right? Come on. Whoa. <laughs> Continual professional development. Yeah, there you go. What we have is that uh, we get trained. Okay, and so. Uh, part of, I think, a robust um, CPD curriculum should be some sort of training in, in the fundamentals of, of, the, most, uh, of the, the, the most widely spoken languages, or at least the language profile of most of the students that come to our schools. 
And really, for languages that are from the same language family, so Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, French, will, will have the same issues. And once you're armed with that information, it really gives you a predictive uh, tool. You can, you can give much more on-the-spot, individualistic um, feedback to your students. If you know that in, in Japanese and, and Korean, it's not common to, you, you don't have to express the subject or the object unless it's absolutely necessary. And if you notice that your, your Japanese and Korean students are dropping subjects, dropping objects, you could just, you don't have to say it in front of the whole class in case some students feel that you're, you know, you're being, you're giving preferential treatment to some other students, but you could just take them aside or, you know, just give, if they're, uh, just give them some one-to-one -one feedback and say, this is the way, you know, your language is like this, English is like this. And again, you might have some of those eureka moments where it's, okay, great. And it also encourages students to be more mindful. It does. One of the things I'm constantly at my students is to try to observe, what, don't, don't just open your mouth and say a load of words. <laughs> you know, just don't, just think about what you're saying. Think about, you know, think about what, what are the mistakes you, you constantly make. What is this situation? Are you talking, is, are you representing something that's happening in the present, the past, the future, whatever it is? And, you know, try to be mindful about your, about their production. It makes, I think, it makes you a better teacher, and it actually makes you a bit more empathetic. It really does. Like, and I, like, I absolutely put my hand up to my own shame. I am one of those teachers that once has made fun of their students in the staff room for saying something silly. No. <laughs> the only one. You haven't either, either. Yeah. <laughs> but it does make you a bit more empathetic. It does make you, when, when you're in that position of having to be forced to, to understand those rules, you may be less likely to go into the classroom and, and, and then say, you know, to be, um, to, uh, you know, like, to, or like, to, yeah, to be a bit more understanding if students don't, don't automatically get uh, something, you know, they don't automatically get defining relative clauses of the third condition and you might say, well, okay, this, it's actually kind of hard because I've been on the receiving end of the, of the instruction.